What's up, Artemers? Today we're going to be talking about some pretty heavy stuff, so be sure to be sitting with extra gravity. To get down to business, we're going to be talking about content creating and authenticity, as well as burnout. As you may have noticed, it seems like everyone today wants to be a content creator. Even big businesses are capitalizing on this fact with endless and endless ads of creation and learn from me's and all that jazz. But on the flip side here, we also have content creators coming out and saying, I am overworked, I am so tired and I make too much stuff, um, I'm burned out, man. And that's what we're going to talk about. We aren't going to talk about big business capitalizing on creative activity <laughs> as much as content creators capitalizing on their own creativity. And so with that, I would like to introduce you to Nietzsche, the portable Nietzsche by translated by Walter uh, Kaufman. Um, in this section called Toward a Psychology of the Artist. If there is to be art, if there is to be any aesthetic doing and seeing, one physiological condition is indispensable. Frenzy. Frenzy must first have enhanced the excitability of the whole machine, else there is no art. All kinds of frenzy, however diversely conditioned, have the strength to accomplish this. Above all, the frenzy of sexual excitement. This most ancient and original form of frenzy. And Aleister Crowley would definitely agree with that. Also, the frenzy that follows all cra great cravings. All strong effects, the frenzy of feasts, contests, feats of daring, victory, all extreme movement, the frenzy of cruelty, the frenzy in destruction, the frenzy under certain meteorological influences, as for example the frenzy of the spring, or under the influence of narcotics, and finally the frenzy of will. The frenzy of an overcharged and swollen will. What is essential in such frenzy is the feeling of increased strength and fullness. In this state, one enriches everything out of one's own fullness. Whatever one sees, whatever one wills, is swelled, taut, strong, overloaded with strength. A man in this state transforms things until they mirror his power, until they are reflections of his own perfection. This having to transform into perfection is art. Even everything that he is not yet becomes for him an occasion of joy in himself. In art, man enjoys himself as perfection. It would be permissible to imagine an opposite state, a specific anti-artistry by instinct, a mode of being which would impoverish all things, making them thin and consumptive. And as a matter of fact, history is rich in such anti-artists, in such people who are starved by life and must of necessity grab things, eat them out, and make them more meager. The first section of today's video is called Where is art from? Or where does art come from? Taking Nietzsche's Will's, sw Will Swollen Artist as well as the Anti-Artist, we will start with the first and say that their art comes from their own will and drive and force. The term frenzy here can also be taken as a form of boredom, where artists can feel bored 
and from this they can gain new ideas. Some artists who are extremely will-driven and swollen will see art in every single thing around them. To the anti-artist, this can be seen in people who have funneled themselves too close into one specific niche, or they partake in the world of non-exhaustive trends online. Nietzsche's word consumptive here for anti-artists can be from a state of fear as well as financial security and the algorithms. It's basically creating videos that you know other people will watch. This is because these types of topics are trendy and sometimes these will help people gain in popularity because the trend the topics that are trending are being looked up and thusly you might catch on that bandwagon. Most of all, anti-artists create in a sense of imitation as well as repetition in their form of consumption and pushing out content. Whereas will swollen artists create out of confidence and this pushes authenticity. I'm going to be using a couple different example creators that I absolutely adore and love and they all have videos that are very similar on this topic so I want to be sprinkling in their amazing thoughts. Sorry my dog's got so much energy tonight, he's just non-stop going everywhere. But anyways, I think two perfectly amazing examples of this really everyone I'm talking about here, would be Amanda from Swell Entertainment as well as Tiffany Berg. Both of their channels are super fantastic and they have found a way to pretty much not have a niche at all. In Amanda's words, you have some people who once they start getting a little bit of traction on TikTok, they're like, okay, the algorithm likes this, so I can only do this. And it's kind of like a forcing of a niche, like forcing a certain persona, whereas YouTube, it's smarter to niche down, or you can do what I do and just be aggressively against niching down aside from me sitting here and talking to you. That's my niche. Hi, I'm Amanda. What they have is a form of art and creativity as well as a job and salary and it seems like they both enjoy it a lot because they just talk about whatever they want to. They're not, again, funneled into talking about one specific thing. The flip side of anti-artists here it would be when you are watching a video or looking at someone's art piece and you can see that they were not driven to create it. One example of this that one of my managers actually gave me is through art versus commissioned art. And sometimes when a commissioned art piece is to look like just something else that an artist has done in their free time and out of joy and inspiration, they won't be able to replicate it for a commissioned work and they might have to say, no, I can't recreate that. I wasn't even there at the time. <laughs> Um, and I thought that was a really beautiful example because it really shows how driven you can be to create something and you can just move on from that. What's anti-art about this is that the consumption or creation of just making the same thing over and over and over again is that the inspiration is no longer there. It doesn't follow every single time. Donna from Psych IRL says from her and her team's research that authenticity comes from growing and changing as a human being. People shouldn't be looked at as people with fixed values. As Ibarra said, look at people like an unfinished work of art. Allow them to change, allow them to grow. It may feel inauthentic for a while, but that's how authenticity actually is. If not, they become stagnant in their ways. And so rather than stagnation, a YouTube video or a YouTube channel should look like a diary rather than a single human being 
from start to finish when some creators have been on the platform for years and years. There is no possible way that you can be the same person from start to finish. A channel was treated like a diary, so every upload would be comparable to one journal entry. A video was a mere glimpse of a creator's thoughts that day, whether they get something off their chest or they feel like doing something creative. You don't get a full picture of a person reading one entry, like you don't get a full picture of a YouTuber watching one video. To better understand them, you need to read the whole diary to see how much development this person has shown. Donna points out, I can't remember if this is from her research, that people can evolve into growing, changing, a progress of a human being. And what social media does is breaks this into a sort of forever you as we no longer see life as a sort of linear fashion, as Donna puts it, and this creates a digital timeline where only the current you exists. An example of this can be seen in TV shows and cartoons that we've all grown up watching where characters really do not change as a person from start to finish. This would be pretty much like sitcoms and cartoons, but of course other things people don't progress and have their own hero's journey. Instead of seeing someone live authentically in a linear fashion, as humans are naturally supposed to, our phones allow us to peer into any stage of life, the good and the bad. I believe this whole video, and I would definitely suggest you to go watch it, um, fits very well into our model as a swollen and artistic will will always look to reach beyond its current self and will look to grow and progress in its art and creation. I know when I am having a stagnant art period, my will for it goes down. <laughs> um, I always want my art to improve and I want to reach the highest points. As Nietzsche said, strength, perfection. We always look to this when we feel driven to create. Please do not mind my dog eating. Apparently he's hungry. Again from Nietzsche, Frenzy must first have enhanced the excitability of the whole machine, else there is no art. All creators may experience burnout once in their lifetime. More than definitely more than once. Um, but as Swell Entertainment Amanda said, Doing what you want and being authentic in your art definitely adds to the ability to create. I believe that at this point in time, TikTokers, like people who are just instantly popular, are more at risk of burnout than someone who's a YouTuber like myself. Mainly that has to do with money and also content. Another video that I found very inspirational into making this video would be from Mina Lee and her video on TikTok, fast fashion. Capitalism. BS. More than anything, I would like to make the comparison between fast fashion and fast content, which is very pretty much what inauthentic creators do, where they just flip out what everybody is watching. Authentic creators can do this as well, but I think inauthentic creators do this much, much, much more often. And so fast content uses trends that originated somewhere else as an original idea. Many forms of social media generally approve of this method of content making because people enjoy differing perspective and experiences on the same thing. I would also like to make it clear here that people can be on trend while staying authentic as long as they are driven to create that content and not driven specifically for the financial gain. That, that is the difference here. So keep that in mind. Why is this a bad thing? Well, other than stealing a designer's hard work, the turnover rate for fast fashion leads to overconsumption, and overconsumption leads to a negative environmental impact. And similarly to fast content, I would say that this 
it has a very detrimental impact on creativity. What is harmful in the event of creators trying to hop on trends is that some creators will feel negative emotional impacts on that they can't get it out quick enough and that they won't get all the views. Nowadays, with the invention of social media and the internet, the trend cycle has gotten a lot shorter. This is when we start seeing the rise of things like micro-trends. This is pretty much directly connected to the fact that they are not making content that they want to be making, and they only want to be con making content that people will be watching. I think it is possible to have a will that is driven completely by people watching you, um, but that is an entire another can of worms. In this case, it is consumptive and anti-artistry, so we're just going to leave it at that. What Mina suggests for the world of fast fashion, we can also suggest for the world of content making, which is to not follow trends exactly in the broadest sense of the term, but to find a category that fits your exact aesthetic versus trends which pretty much belong to the entire internet and i love aesthetics i think not only do they create little lovely online communities for people who share the same interests but they're also a great way to sidestep micro trends and overconsumption. or i'll reference alistair crowley here again and say do what you want to do do what thou will and don't just do what you think you should be doing and capitalizing on what's trendy. The next section for the video here is much, much shorter, and that is the differences in content creating using Star Wars as our uh, model with the light and dark forces and what they believe in philosophically. The light side of the forest finds their strength in loyalty, compassion, and peace. Whereas the dark side of the forest finds their strength in jealousy, hatred, and fear, specifically fear of loss. I think this really translates to what we're talking about today because people have either loyalty to their own creative instinct or fear of loss in their trendy social climate or maybe uh, financial security. And so they create what they pretty much don't want to be creating. And we don't want that. On the side of the light force, I would say that artists create if, when, what, and how they want to make um, art. I wouldn't say that that necessarily follows all senses of making art financially. But that is the last section that we're going to be talking about today. So stay tuned for that. What's most important in the artist on the light side is that they have peace and compassion and love for their heart, for, for their art. And so because of this, they take lots of time in doing so. This doesn't mean that you can't stay to a schedule, but it does mean that a schedule might be counterintuitive to the creative process. Now, because of these differences, I would argue that artists on the light side of the force are less likely to experience creator burnout, whereas creators on the dark side of the force are more likely to experience burnout because they are looking to create as much content as possible for a monetary purpose versus artistic purposes. So the next section that we're going to be talking about today is what does art mean? And for this, we're going to go back to our portable Nietzsche and flip to L'Art for L'Art or Art for Art. A psychologist, on the other hand, asks, what does all art do? Does it not praise, glorify, choose, prefer? With all this, it strengthens or weakens certain valutations. Is this merely a moreover, an accident, something in which the artist's instinct had no share? Or is it not the very preposition of the artist's ability? Does his basic instinct aim at art, or rather at the sense of art, at life, 
at a desirability of life? Art is the great stimulus to life. How could one understand it as purposeless, as aimless, as l'art pour l'art? One question remains. Art also makes apparent much that is ugly, hard, and questionable in life. Does it not thereby soil life for us? And indeed, there have been philosophers who have attributed this sense to it. Liberation from the will was what Schopenhauer taught as the overall end of art, and with admiration he found the great utility of tragedy in its evoking resignation. But this, as I have already suggested, is the pessimist perspective and evil eye. We must appeal to the artists themselves. What does the tragic artist communicate of himself? It is not precisely the state without fear in the face of the fearful and questionable that he is showing. The state itself is a great desideratum. Whoever knows it honors it with the greatest honors. He communicates it, must communicate it, provided he is an artist, a genius of communication. Courage and freedom of feeling before a powerful enemy before a sublime calamity, before a problem that arouses dread, this triumphant state is what the tragic artist chooses, what he glorifies. Before tragedy, what is warlike in our soul celebrates its Saturnalia. Whoever is used to suffering, whoever seeks out suffering, the heroic man praises his own being through tragedy. To him alone, the tragedian presents this drink of sweetest cruelty. So, Nietzsche pretty much lays it down for us that art cannot be purposeless. Art for art's sake doesn't exist. It always has a form of political stance in it, no matter what. Even from my videos, you can probably tell what form of political stances or opinions on anything that I have just by saying anything on them. And through art, we also find an understanding to our own opinion. And this can be very liberative. As Nietzsche referenced, Schopenhauer believes that art is an escape from our own wills and desires. This is the something that I am on the fence about currently, in which I think it is, but at the same time, I think it's a wonderful meditative as well as spiritual event in and of itself. But to this, Nietzsche argues that one cannot not communicate themselves through their own art. Through creating, we are forced into confronting our own opinions on whatever subject matter we have chosen. And so what Nietzsche is arguing here is that in art, and through the time that it takes, this reflection period cannot actually remove us from our own wills and desires, but actually pushes us closer to our wills and helps us better understand ourselves. But more or less, what Schopenhauer says is that our desires, in a very Buddhist sense, need to be detached from our being. And we can do this through art as it is a very meditative form of action. Sidestepping to Heidegger's work, I believe art falls somewhere in lines between uh, autopilot and analysis. You can check out my video on that somewhere. I don't even know what I said about art, but I'm pretty sure it is that you find yourself in a mode of autopilot as well as analysis at the same time. For me, it's almost as if the rest of the world doesn't exist. One beautiful reference to this phenomena I found in the Iced Coffee Hour podcast. I had a very time getting clips from it before recording this, so I don't know if I'll be able to after. But in a video with Jeanette McCurdy, she talks about creating and writing her book and saying that in her art, she has to put all of herself into it. And so Jeanette McCurdy would be on the Nietzsche side of this as she says that all of herself goes into it and she communicates her own self and passion 
through her art. One interesting note that she also pointed out is that if she felt that she hadn't started a project with filling the entirety of it with her passion and drive and will, then she was much more likely to not actually finish the project. I would completely agree with this and say that that sounds correct, but I would also disagree that I have had driven um, creativity to create something and put all of my everything into it and still didn't finish. But I think, you know, same same goes for everybody. The host on that episode actually said something very interesting in that he puts all of himself and his emotionality into his video making, but at the same time, he also gets a lot of his topics from his audience. He said that he would be very excited to have the opportunity to talk about what he would want to talk about, but at the same time, it really sounded like he was very inspired from his audience. I think it should be very possible to get topics from external influences and not entirely just from your own self and still be driven to do it because you're driven to do whatever you're driven to do. I don't think you can really control your will. You can definitely control your will. You have free will. I'm just saying, gut feelings a gut feeling. You can't help the things your heart longs for. But overall, as Nietzsche said, art is the great stimulus to life. And through this, we can better understand ourselves and our own opinions and our authentic self. And so going back to Donna's video on Jenna Marbles and why she called it the end of authenticity, pretty much, is because... With Jenna deleting most of her channels that didn't reflect her current self, she's pretty much stating that a current self exists, and this is not the case, especially in the case of people who create content non-stop. For Jenna Marbles, this is an exemption because she has stopped, um, but for everyone else in the world who creates content at weekly, monthly, or whenever they want, their opinion on whatever they're making will always change. That's not to say that all artists create things that are directly political, but even if you are an artist who just draws pretty ladies, the uh, clothes that they are wearing or how they were posed or everything that, you know, is in the shot and composition, this is technically a political stance or even a cultural stance. In either case, it is showing who you are and what you're thinking at the time. One example of this that I would say is if you have a piece of art that you created and it had a very obvious political stance or opinion or anything of that sort, and time moves on years later, however many somethings later, and you look at it again and you have like an off-gut feeling it's probably because your opinion changed about something that was going on. The next section is creator burnout. If art is the great stimulus to life, then how does burnout happen? I haven't actually talked about creator burnout uh, uh, too much in the video because there are so many videos on the topic that I would very much suggest you go watch. The most important takeaway here, and from pretty much any video that you may watch, is that creators who experience burnout are generally the creators who are trying to do way too much with their time. This is definitely more likely or more easily done with inauthentic content as the research is generally already pre-done in the case of YouTube videos or the subject matter has already been drawn in the case of hashtag draw this in your style. But creating and enjoying art should not be causing people to burn out. And this is exactly in the case of moderation of all things. Just like any old job, a fry cook, a truck driver, whatever, if you are creating yourself as to be the asset of your, your being, you're going to need moderation. One great way of talking about this that Swell Entertainment Amanda said is that 
you are being on all the time. The point with avoiding burnout and my own experience with burnout is trying to find a way to not only diversify your content and where you are making money, but diversify what you are doing with your time so that not everything you are doing revolves around making content and being on. And I definitely have experienced this in working from home. Another case of being on all the time would be when you are on social media either trying to reply to all of the comments that you are getting or you are trying to promote yourself as much as possible or trying to network and communicate with other creators so you can be a part of the community you're trying to blah 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 with only so much available time in your life and day. One fantastic story about burnout and growing as a YouTuber from Amanda would be when she first grew up and blew up from her... I don't remember the show, but she was on some show as a, a audience member. And so she blew up and she didn't even know how to react other than to just not react. And I thought that this was very inspirational in that pretty much what she did was that she just continued making what she had been planning on making. And she just kept doing whatever popped in her head and she wrote down as a fun idea. And her, her will is driven and it's beautiful. Both Amanda and Tiffany Ferg have also said that you should not monetize every single aspect of your life. And I would more than definitely agree with this because if you do that, you will just go back to the never-ending cycle of what to do on social media and how many platforms to talk to, how many people to talk to, how many, how many... It can be very detrimental to your mental and physical health to be too focused on social media. Even content creators, influencers, we experience this too, and sometimes to a worse degree because, again, <laughs> capitalism our entire financial well-being is tied to it so we have to stay in it and we can't leave it because it's our job this is the conflict i have all the time it literally never ends my number one suggestion scott kramer shout out to you here just don't go online another part of amanda's video on burnout and such is that she had experienced this while working a shift in her car on break and editing and she just suddenly realized I'm overworking myself and I think this is a fantastic view and example of objectifying yourself as a healthy happy human being and where you lie on that scale if a stranger saw you right now what would they be thinking would they be saying, is this girl seriously working a shift and now she's on her laptop doing something? What even could she be doing? And I think when you're in the moment, you're going to assume other people know you're working on something else. But this is actually a social phenomenon that I did not come up with myself and I really wish I could remember the name. But more or less, you just objectify yourself as you're not yourself. You're not someone grinding and making money and making that bank. You're another human being. How are you doing? And I think that can be a really healthy look at yourself and just understanding yourself as just like one of anyone else. But that, that's only uh, my, my small add-on to Amanda's suggestion of burnout in that she said to take stock in your life. This form of stepping away from yourself and your own wills is very similar to what we were talking about with Schopenhauer. Yeah, this is not escaping from your wills and desires, but merely transforming your desires and wills into those of the audience and the views and the algorithm and what you think other people want. And you may feel that you are happy and meditative in your work, when in all actuality, it's just another labor-intensive job that, that you have. Which then, of course, turns to burnout. Obviously. Anyone with a labor-intensive job 
gets burnt out every once in a while. So here's my number one suggestion. Can we just normalize content creators taking a hiatus from their work and not expect people to follow a twice a week schedule or a twice a month schedule for their entire lives and years and like it's, it's almost you're asking too much of a content creator and you're holding them captive to what you want as they're getting paid. I'm not even sure who's benefiting from this form of capitalization other than the audience, in which the audience could not be so GD consumptive too. Like, that's true too. My last section here is pretty short. If you wanted to stick around to the very, very end, please do. The last section here is called Making a Living Off of Art Authentically. Now, I just want to say first things first, this should be possible because of creators like Amanda from Swell Entertainment and lots and lots of others. And because of this, I want to just say, period. It's possible. You can do art sustainably and authentically. What Amanda suggests is not to narrow yourself down into a niche too small. And this is very important when you yourself are the asset. Uh, you cannot wear yourself down into smithereens just because you're making the big bucks. It's unfortunate, but it's true. I don't know. I just think of anything with content creation is one, set up systems for yourself to like, let yourself recharge. At the end of the day, whether you agree with this or not, creators are that, they are creatives. Whether you are famous for being hot, famous for doing YouTube, famous for doing crazy pranks, you are a creative and you need to find ways to help yourself recharge so that you can continue to do creative things. Does that make sense? I'm saying this really weirdly. And it's also possible to be authentic while following trends. Being authentic is just doing literally whatever you want to do. It's whatever your will drives you to do. Social media and digital online platform communities are also a very large part of making money off of art and this I think is a whole whopping topic that this entire section might just be another video in itself and so uh, if you guys are all the way here to the end i have to thank you so 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 much you are amazing i have no idea how long this will be i've been recording for two hours and i'm now sweating i hope you can't tell um but i want to end the video today here with a question from donna psych irl's video on Jenna Marbles in the context of making art monetarily authentically. And what Donna asks is, I feel like these YouTubers made the right choice by deleting content they felt like didn't represent them anymore. That should be normalized. If we go back to our diary example though, this would be like the creator ripping up pivotal entries in their diaries. As you can see, we can no longer get the full picture of authenticity. Now, we can certainly put up the debate whether or not we need to see that full picture and I think I'll throw that question to you. How do you feel about these creators deleting a number of their videos? Current YouTubers believe they're insulated from this phenomenon entirely. They assume their past controversies will remain in their past because their current audience has seen their life progress. To this, I would like to say that it is really in the hands of the creator. But in the video on Jenna Marbles, Donna was looking for a reactionary video from Philly D from some of his old work, so Philly D, watching Philly D, but all she was able to find was the original, original video. And this is because he deleted both of them, but the original was somewhere on the internet. And as we all grew up learning, once you post something on the internet, it will be there forever. For this reason alone, creators should have diary-like channels or however, whatever, 
streams because the skeletons in your closet will always, always, always be there. It's the internet. It's forever. Another thing that we could pull in here is Buddhism, as we always do on this channel, and say that your current self doesn't exist. And so to delete content on your channel that reflects your current self would be impossible because you would be deleting every video every time. That's just the simple answer there. <laughs> you are an always growing, ever changing person. And so if you want to create authentically, don't lie, don't delete your videos. So to the artists and anti-artists out there, I just have to ask, what drives your will and are you driven? It's really hard to ask because I know so many people have depression. I think depression literally takes the swollen will and squishes it. Um, it's freaking terrible, but we move past it, right? So I gotta end the video before I burn um, that you see is off for the audio quality. So Thank you guys for sticking all the way to the end. I hope that you have enjoyed the video and have a great rest of your day. Eat your dinner and I love you. Bye! I feel like it's against the philosophy of everything I say to ask you guys to subscribe to my channel, but could you subscribe? That'd be awesome. I really appreciate all of you guys' support and love for everything, and I really enjoy seeing you guys in the comments. Uh, so, I'll see you there.